Our reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 5. It is the passage that contains the story that Mr. Bunky was sharing with the young people. And the scripture says that it came to pass that as people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a drop. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night. And have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes. And their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. God's word for his people. Thanks be to God. I always like reading the scriptures when they talk about the disciples or the apostles, the ones that Jesus specifically called by name. I guess in a sense we're all disciples who choose to follow Jesus, but The Bible gives us 12 that, again, Jesus calls individually and specifically, and their names are given to us. And I like reading about them because they're ordinary people. They're common people. They're not princes or emperors. They're not priests. They're not the religious leaders. They're not part of Herod's court. They're just ordinary people. Like you and I. And I don't mean that in a negative way because I think all of you are extraordinary in many ways. But when it comes to our walk of life, we're just ordinary. We have ordinary jobs. We have, in many ways, ordinary lives. And if you're like me, you're just trying to do the best you can from day to day and week to week to make it and put food on the table and make sure that the home has heat and make sure that whatever needs to be fixed is, is fixed and make sure that the, the children are, are happy and healthy and, you, you know, you just one day to the next, right? And we have a lot to be thankful for. And although none of us may have huge bank accounts or Yachts, uh, you know, uh, patrolling the Caribbean or, um, you know, flying all over the world to exotic vacations or things like that. I think if we do have children that are happy and healthy and we do have food on the table and we do have a warm, safe home, we do have a lot to be thankful for. I really think we do. And my weeks are very busy, as I imagine many of yours are. Some of you uh, in in retirement may still continue to have very busy weeks, but you can also remember back that when you're in the in the the, the throes of of raising your family and when working hard every day, that the the, the weeks are just compacted and full of all sorts of things. And I've grown, especially in this past year, I feel like the Lord has helped me grow in in the appreciation of Sunday. 
And although we, we, we do get up and we get dressed and we come to church, it is a time of refreshing. It is a time of, of just to be thankful. It's a time of rest. At least it's supposed to be. Sometimes our, our Sundays become just as busy as any other day, but I don't really think that they should be. The Lord rested on the seventh day, didn't He? And if the Lord rested, I think He knows that we need that rest as well. So I'm thankful that we do have this time to come together and to be with Jesus because He makes all the difference. Peter and James and John and Andrew, Thaddeus, and all of Matthew, all of the disciples, they were ordinary people going through life day to day, just trying to make it, trying to be there for their family. And it just so happened that Peter and Andrew and James and John, they were fishermen. Matthew was a tax collector, and he was called from his life of being a tax collector. Peter and Andrew and James and John, they were called from a life of being a fisherman. And like Bunky said to the children, this was not just their hobby. This is what they relied on for sustenance. This is how they provided. This was their way of life. And the Bible tells us here that, that one day Jesus went to where they were. And that's another reason why I really love reading about Jesus calling the disciples. Because He comes to them. Now, there are times in the Bible where we read where people come to Jesus. Some call to accuse Him or to try to confuse Him or to try to get Him to say something that they can charge Him with. We read about those accounts. Some come because they want to see what all the hoopla is about. Remember Zacchaeus, you know, climbing up in the tree wanting to see Jesus? Some come to Jesus because they're desperate for a change in their life, for a healing in their life, like the woman who had the issue of blood. But in the ones that Jesus specifically called by name, we read that He comes to them. He comes into their world, into their somewhat ordinary life. And He engages them in the conversation. And I don't know about you, but that, there's just always something special about that. About Jesus, the Lord of all, the King of kings. And He comes to them. And He comes to us. And Jesus went to the lake. And the people were all around Him and they were hearing Him. And they were, there were so many of them that they... They, they kind of forced him to, 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 to separate where he had to ask Peter, hey, let, let me get in your boat and, and, and let's go out a little while so that I can have a platform to which I can reach and preach and teach to all these people here. So Simon Peter says, okay, we'll do that. And he paddles them out in the boat a little ways and Jesus begins to teach the people. But then after that, something interesting happens. After he's done teaching the people, and you kind of get in your mind that they begin to disperse a little bit, then Jesus looks at Simon Peter and says, Now I want you to go out into the deep, and I want you to let down your nets. And I always try to put my place in Simon Peter here because he says, You know, we've been out here working all night. You see, when Jesus came to them, they were in the final phases of wrapping up their work day, which at that point was the work night. You know, they had the night shift. They'd been out all night trying to catch fish. Why? Because it was their business. Why? Because that's what they had to do to provide for their families. It was their ordinary way of making money, and they had been out all night, and they hadn't had a good night, had they? You know, we, we go fishing sometimes. <clears throat> and if you're like me, you really just like being out in the water. You want to catch some fish. But if you don't, you still had a peaceful day, right? Most of the time. No big deal. But commercial fishermen, if they don't catch, 
It's a big deal. And for all intents and purposes, Peter and James and John and Andrew, they were commercial fishermen of that day. And they had been out all night and they hadn't caught anything. So then they had to clean their boats and clean their nets and wash their nets and put everything up because probably in seven, eight more hours they were going to have to go again and see if they could do a little better. But Jesus says, no, go out now. And I'm thinking, well, maybe Peter might have been thinking in his mind, you know, you're a good preacher, you're a good teacher, but, you know, I'm the expert fisherman and we've been out all night and hadn't done anything. But, but then he says, but, but because you've said so, because I like you, Jesus, you seem to be a good guy, seem to have some authority in the way that you preach and teach, so I'll take you out there, let's go. And so he goes out and they go into the deep, the Bible says. And he drops his nets. And when he begins to try to bring them up again, they are so full of fish that they begin to break. And he has to beckon the other ships to come to help him haul in all those fish. Now, the amount of fish that they caught was miraculous, no doubt. But I don't know about you, but I've also been out with fishing And you can go and you can fish all day or maybe several hours in one spot and catch nothing. And then you go a little bit further and try somewhere else. And then you see somebody else in a boat go to the exact same spot and all of a sudden they're reeling something in. Think it was maybe that that, that Jesus just knew where the right spot was. Well, he probably did, but that's not the miracle here. Peter was a good fisherman, no doubt. That's how he made his living. But he'd been all night toiling, working hard. Him and his brother, James and John in another boat, they'd done all that they could. And when they came back to shore, they had nothing to show for it. Then they go out, and there's so many fish that you can't even hardly bring them in the boat. So i got to ask you, what's the difference? What's the difference? It's somewhat obvious from the text. The difference was Jesus was in the boat. What? Jesus was present. And I don't really think it was so much the words that were said. And I don't think it's so much where they went. Because probably Peter had fished all over that lake throughout his life. And he probably knew all the good spots. And he had probably been to that spot. And he might have even been to that same spot the night before when they didn't catch anything. But the difference was Jesus was in the boat. Now, what is interesting about the gospel is that it doesn't always get us to do something entirely new. A lot of times, Jesus says, go back to where you were. Go back to the things you've been doing all along. But this time, take me with you. And you're going to see a difference. You see, when we come to know Jesus Christ, it doesn't necessarily mean that our circumstances immediately change. When you come to the altar, whenever you did that in your life, or if you haven't do it, done it yet, listen. Listen to this. But when you come to that altar... You didn't come up with a new job, did you? You didn't come up with new family members. You didn't come up with new friends, a new neighborhood, a new house, a new car. No. Your circumstances were the same. And I don't think Jesus says, leave all that. But often he says, go back into it, but this time, take me with you. And He gives us a new heart and He gives us a new outlook on things. 
And we know the experience of being redeemed and forgiven. And He gives us His Holy Spirit and He says, now go back to that relationship. Now go back to that job. Now go back to whatever situation in life has been difficult for you. But this time, take me with you. You're still going to have some pain. You're still going to have some suffering. You're still going to have some some stress in your life. You're still going to have things that get you down and that grieve you to your heart. You're still going to have those that that, that you have trouble getting along with. And no matter how much you've tried, you, 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 know, you, you just can't seem to get through. You're going to still have jobs that seem overwhelming. You're still going to have a flat tire and a a, a, a busted water line or a, you know a, a new a roof that needs new shingles and all that sort of stuff but Jesus says now go back but take me with you and the difference is Jesus will be in the boat now a great example of this from the scriptures is is from what is actually the smallest book in the Bible Philemon and Philemon was a slave owner, but he was a Christian. And, you know, the culture was a little different back then, but um, there were many people that were in bondage during those days. And Philemon had a, a slave na- named Onesimus that ran away. And back then, of course, you know, a slave running away was like basically stealing property. Well, Onesimus eventually found his way to Paul, under God's providence. Paul preached to him and Onesimus became a Christian. And Onesimus would have loved to stay with Paul and continue to support him in his ministry. Actually, Paul was in jail at the time and Onesimus was was there to help minister unto him. But Paul said, no, you can't stay with me. I'm sending you back to where you came from. I'm sending you back to your owner, Philemon, but I'm going to send this letter with you. And this letter says to Philemon, Onesimus is coming back to you, but something's different. And what's different is he has given his life to Jesus Christ. And I want you to receive him no longer as a servant, but as a brother. I would love to have him here with me, Paul says. But I think it's better that he go back to you. And the difference is now he's bringing Jesus with him. We come to Jesus Christ. Or better said, he comes to us. And if we let him in our life, if we let him in our boat, if we let him in our heart. And we listen to him, just as Peter did. And Peter didn't understand why Jesus was telling him to go back out there. In his worldly wisdom, he thought he probably thought it was a little crazy. There ain't no fish out there right now. It's not the right time. We didn't catch anything. I don't understand. But because you said it, I'm going to do it. We don't have to always understand. We're not going to always understand things that God asks us to do sometimes. Well, we feel that tugging in our heart, and if we're obedient, He's got something wonderful planned. We gotta be like Peter, we gotta let Jesus in the boat, and He may send us right back into our circumstances, but He's gonna be with us all the way, and He makes all the difference in our life. Whether it's in our relationship with our loved ones, whether it's in our relationship with our co-workers, whether it's in our, our parenting roles. You know, so often we see the results of people trying to parent without Jesus. And I want to invite people to try it with Jesus. Same kids. Same circumstances. But it's going to be different if Jesus is in the boat. 
People struggle with their careers and with their jobs and they're stressed out. You can do it without them. But I'm encouraging you to try it with Him. Same, same job, same task, same deadlines, same boss, same co-workers. But try it with Jesus. Try it with Him in your boat. And see that He does make a difference. Now I want to close with the lyrics to a song that I came across. Uh, I'm not sure who actually wrote the song, but uh, it's been sung often by um, gospel singer Shirley Caesar. Some of you are familiar with her. But it's called Jesus Makes the Difference. And it goes a little something like this. I ain't going to sing it, don't worry. <laughs> Folks, don't understand why I'm so happy. Why I have such joy down deep within. Circumstances can't control my feelings. Because Jesus' blood has washed away my sin. I'm singing and shouting hallelujah. Jesus gave my life a brand new start. Nevermore I'm doubting. Oh, I feel like shouting. Because Jesus made the difference in my heart. (laughs) Chorus says, Jesus made the difference. Jesus made the difference. Jesus made the difference in my life. He cleansed my heart, made me whole, gave me joy down in my soul. Jesus made the difference in my life. When the devil comes around to tempt me, I just say, old man, get thee behind. I can't think about the things you tell me because Jesus made the difference in my mind. When I think about the love of Jesus, I can't help but let the praises roll. I just want to shout it. I'm going to tell the whole world about it. Jesus made the difference in my soul. The difference is Jesus was in the boat. And he'll be with you as well. If you'll let him climb in. May God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful story that was shared with the young people earlier in the service and that we've read from the scriptures of the call of Simon Peter, James and John from their life of fishing to a life of ministry. We thank you, Lord, that you come to us and if we'll let you in our heart, if we'll let you in our boats, Lord, you will be there with us. And we may go right back into the same circumstance. We may go right back into having to do some of the same things and deal with the same people, God, but the difference will be you are there with us and you will never leave us or forsake us, God, and you will give us strength and you will give us a new heart and a new mind and we'll, we'll have a new focus in life, Lord. All things have passed away and behold, all things become new in you, Lord, and we thank you, God, for the renewing and the restoration that you offer us through the glorious gospel. We pray today, Lord, if someone has never come forward, never allowed Jesus in their heart, never allowed you, Jesus, to come into their boat and direct their life, we pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. And we ask all these things in praise in Jesus' name. Amen.